So this is the uh, determining the composition of a cobalt nitrate sample by visible spectroscopy from the General Chemistry Lab manual. So in terms of what we expect you to learn today, our basic, our major thing will be using what we call an, a UV spectrophotometer, but there's also tabulation, some graphing, uh, manipulation of solvent solution concentrations. Uh, we'll do mass percent really, but again, manipulation of solutions and um, being able to do some basic uh, form uh, function fitting and things like that. Okay, so we're going to be focusing on uh, radiate, uh, electromagnetic radiation and the absorption of electromagnetic radiation by molecules. So they can absorb all sorts of different um, uh, energy uh, from the electromagnetic spectrum. It could range from sort of visible light, which is what we're going to be talking about today, but it could include, you know, a little bit further, the IR, the ultraviolet uh, microwave radiation. So, of course, everybody's microwave food has seen that. So molecules have very distinct ways that they can absorb energy uh, from the electromagnetic spectrum. And the energy is used by the molecules to basically undergo various kinds of transitions. And depending on the type of radiation, they can correspond to different kinds of transitions. So, for instance, infrared, uh, which we normally think of heat, normally uh, involves uh, the increase of bond vibration. So you'll see changes in bond vibration as a result of the absorption of infrared radiation. Um, and when we talk about UV vis, a lot of times what we're talking about is the um, excitement of electrons from one energy level, whether it's a certain kind of bonding orbital, uh, you know, a sigma bonding or some or pi bonding or whatever the case, a d orbital, some sort of molecular orbital to a higher orbital of higher energy. Okay, and so this takes energy in that excitement that's then dictated by the, uh, is, is provided by the absorption of the radiation. And the key thing, and this sort of goes beyond sort of this class, but the idea is that the energy involved in that transition has to match with the energy of the radiation. Of course, energy is then related to frequency. If you remember anything about physics and um, uh, wave theory, you know that frequency, so, so as a result then, you have specific frequencies of electromagnetic radiation that can cause certain types of energy processes that are, are molecular processes in, in, in molecules. And so this then leads to the fact that we can generate this whole field called spectroscopy. And the idea that the energy required to do these transitions is often unique to a specific chemical entity or specific chemical process. And so you'll have unique molecules will have unique absorptions in the spectrum. And we can use that as an identification tool. We can use it as a tool for doing quantification. Okay, and so today the spectroscopy, and so this is a huge field, this is one of the major uh, analytical techniques um, used in chemistry. And so we're going to focus today on the UV visible light spectroscopy. And this usually involves the excitement of electrons into higher energy orbitals, either in an atomic orbital or in a molecular orbital. And the net result is something we can actually see with our eye, we can see um, colors. Okay, so here's a graph, this is from the lab manual, of cobalt chloride uh, hexahydrate. And so you can see on the left then is the absorbance of light, and on the bottom scale there is the wavelength of light. And so you can see that there is a high absorbance, so the peak goes up, so there's an absorbance of relatively green light. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit about you know, the, the, the exact rate, uh, energy uh, that is absorbed is dependent on a lot of factors, um, the atoms themselves, what, and, and a lot of their conditions. So that's sort of beyond the scope of what we're talking about in general chemistry, but the bottom line is they all have slightly, they can have slightly different absorbance maxima. And you can see in this case, cobalt, um, this, this solution of cobalt seems to absorb more strongly in the blue-green. Now, if that absorbs light, that means that everything that goes through the sample is the stuff we see with our eyes. So if you just use a classic color wheel and you absorb in the, uh, you know, 600, 510 nanometer wavelength, you can see that that puts us uh, in the opposite color is what we see, and in this case we see something that looks a little red. And so this solution is the one you'll be working with today is, is kind of pink. So, so that's kind of just the bare bones background. Then the maximum absorbance of molecule ends up becoming one of the defining properties. It defines color, what we actually see, um, and it also can be used then to identify it if you have an unknown mixture. Now there are lots of other molecules that have similar types of absorbances, so it's not an end-all be-all, but it can be particularly useful, and it's especially useful when it comes to quantitating a solution of when it's purely the compound 
that, let's say, for instance, cobalt chloride. Okay, so and the reason why is that the amount of light that's absorbed, okay, so in other words, the, the intensity of the color um, is dependent on, one, the nature of the compound, um, its concentration, and the amount of sample that's in the, the length of the, the path of the light. So we have this equation we call Beer's Law, which is uh, uh, A, which stands for the absorption. That's just a unitless number. Um, this epsilon, which uh, is technically, it's got a lot of different names. It used to be called the extinction coefficient. Now I think most people call it molar absorptivity. We're not going to use it in the sense of moles per whatever. We're going to use it, I think, today in just terms of mass and grams. So, so it's not it's, it's some sort of proportionality constant that basically is compound dependent. So that that is the nature of the compound, and it depends on the wavelength and the nature of the compound in terms of what that number is. Okay, so so you'll have we'll have that extinction coefficient. So that's a constant. Okay, then you have b, which is path length, and in most cases. Um, this, this is a number that's done in centimeters, and usually we have one centimeter path length. So this ends up being one and can be ignored. I think today we're just going to ignore it because we have one centimeter path length. Okay, and then finally C, concentration. Okay, so that is the concentration of your sample. So if you look at it then, you've got absorption is equal to some proportionality constant um, times the concentration. So that's a linear relationship. And so if you graph uh, concentration and absorption, According to Beer's law, you should get a straight line with the slope then being um, the extinction coefficient or whatever you're going to call it. Okay, so, so this ends up being very powerful because it lets you standardize a curve with known concentrations and then take an unknown and then figure out what its concentration is. Okay, so this ends up being one of the, the most essential techniques, especially in biochemistry, uh, used in a lot of other fields as well. Now the equipment that allows you to do this is what we call a spectrophotometer. These used to be really fancy, expensive devices in the thousands of dollars. Now we have these little ones that are drawn on USB ports, so we'll be using those today. And they're designed to measure absorption in very specific wavelengths. And depending on the quality of the instrument, you can get relatively, you can get different sensitivities in that. And the Beer's Law uh, plot will basically be linear on this machine probably from about 0.1 to a little bit over 1. After that, you start having issues where uh, your instrument sensitivity is not good enough or you're overwhelming the machine. And so, so we're going to be using these to measure our samples, um, and there will be instructions provided. So don't use the instructions in the manual. Um, that's for an older machine, but we are at a superior institution with nicer equipment. And so, uh, so we'll be doing something uh, slightly different this time. Okay, so then the quick summary is, is you're going, and this is in the lab manual, you're going to have... A known cobalt chloride solution has got six waters, so six waters of hydration. And then you're going to develop that, you're going to make different concentrations of that, measures the absorbance as 510. So that'll give you the, the Beer's Law plot, as we talked about. Okay, now you're going to take another sample of cobalt nitrate. You don't know how many waters of hydration it has. Okay, so as a result, the, the percent of cobalt in there could be different number uh, compared to what happens with the cobalt chloride. Okay, so you're going to make three unknown solutions of those. Now, we have to add a little bit of sodium chloride. This is mainly because um, I told you this absorption thing can be kind of funny because it depends a lot on the nature of the molecule. And it turns out that the way that the cobalt interacts with the chloride and interacts with nitrate is slightly different, can give slightly different intensities. So you need to chuck in a little bit of sodium chloride. And that's all in the manual. So you don't have to, as long as you see that in the protocol, you'll be fine. And then, again, so you measure the absorption of those three, and so the idea is you generate the curve from the known cobalt chloride six waters uh, salts, and then you use the line to determine the amount of cobalt in the cobalt nitrate, okay? And so we'll have that labeled with this XH2O, and you've got to solve for X then by, um, you know that the cobalt concentration will be the same, so you just have to figure out what percentage uh, of compound um, is cobalt, and that will allow you to figure out how many waters of hydration there are. The lab itself is pretty easy. Um, changes from the manual. We're going to use our own spectrophotometers. The instructions will be next to the machine, and I'll demonstrate a little bit during the pre-lab how to do it. It's pretty easy to use their laptop driven. Uh, you're going to work in groups of four, and so the real key here is you're going to be making eight solutions. You don't want to get the orders of these screwed up, so we need to come up with some way I don't think we're going to have enough stickers or cups or anything that you can do it without. Um, you're just going to need to use your beakers. You've got four groups. So if each person is sort of in charge of, a be of two beakers, 
uh, and they know which ones they have, then this shouldn't be a problem. And we're not going to use molarity uh, very much, I think, in this one, although we, we should. The, 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 the manual doesn't assume that people know how to do molarity. So um, the main thing is, is they're not measuring the volume of the solution after they add the salt. They're just dissolving the salt in there and assuming that there's that the volume of the solvent and the volume of the solution are the same. And, you know, you're doing relatively small amounts of salt. It's like uh, compared to the solvent, sort of at the worst, it'd be like 4%, but it's going to be smaller than that. So this is an okay solution. Now, if you had more concentrated solutions, this becomes an issue. But with this one, we can get by with it. It's kind of a shortcut. It's not ideal, but we're not going to go against sort of what the lab manual is doing on this one. Safety-wise, there's really no hazard to humans. Um, I would not put cobalt down the sink. I wouldn't drink it. Um, but um, we'll have a cobalt solution collection beaker in the hood. You can just dump it in there, and then we'll figure out how to deal with it one way or the other. So again, the complication is going to be beakers. You have to figure out a system amongst yourselves. You're going to need eight solutions, though. And so you'll make them up, and then you'll add 20. I think they asked to add 25 mils of water. To each one, just make sure and, and see so when you stir them, don't spill them. Um, and but other than that, you just have to figure out some way to keep them straight. And remember, you add sodium chloride to those last three unknowns. Then you can just use a transfer pipette to transfer to the spectrophotometer, put it in the spectrophotometer, and we'll show you how to do that. And that's it.